No characters were developed for that. When uh, Disney came up with Pluto and Mickey Mouse and you know, the duck, then they started, the, the theater started demanding the characters. And so we were looking for characters too. But we didn't really have a main character until Porky came along. We will now open our exercises with a recitation by our little friend, Porky P. Well, I had trouble with Porky because he stuttered. And a lot of people said, you can't do that. <laughs> That's why I did it because everybody was using false set of voices. Everybody saw everything sound the same. And I said, what can I do to make this character different? So I called up Warner's casting and said, have you got anybody who stutters? Yeah, they had this Doherty guy who stuttered. And the guy just could not get through a line, you know? And we were doing all our sound on, on film then. There wasn't any tape. If Jack Warner knew how much film I was using, that I was through with animation. So I had to get somebody who would just mimic. And that was Mel, of course. And of course, Mel could do anything. Mel Blanc was able to come up with comic twists on the idea of the stutter. He, he'd start to say one word and wind up saying another, or substitute you know, a shorter word for a longer word. Uh, he, he just added a charm to Porky. I am known as the man with a thousand voices. Shall I do my stuff? Uh, yes, uh, go right ahead. That's a joke, son. That's a joke, Daddy. Yes, that's a joke. Yes, that's a joke. Everybody wants to get into the act. <laughs> Yeah, but, but that was only in 990 in the nine voices. Shucks, I know I've got another one. Well, I'll think of it. Frizz would actually come into the booth with the actor, Mel, and it wasn't just lip service directing. Frizz would stomp around in the room and, you know, and, and, and as I say, act out the character himself, which for the artist is sensational. Mel really had a lot to do with the character becoming popular, I think. I think it's a combination of what we did in animation and what Mel did that made it successful. We were in a new business, Leon Slesser, all he cared about was making dollars, and he was making film, and he didn't know or care what went on in the film as long as it was acceptable to Warner Brothers. As long as he made a buck, he didn't care what the characters were. You know the story of, of uh, Leon Schlesinger walking down the hall and hearing a bunch of guys laughing in one of the rooms, and he opens the door and says, what's everybody laughing about? Why don't you guys get back to work? Well, they were at work. They were thinking up gags for a <laughs> picture. <laughs> I, I was tempted to go to MGM. Uh, it was about 1938 when they opened up a cartoon studio. I thought it was gonna be like, Slicer, you just do your own thing. But it wasn't that way at all. He thought there were greener pastures over there, and all of a sudden, he was saddled with this lousy Captain and the Kids series, which was based on the comic strip at the time, and they were pretty lackluster characters, pretty lackluster cartoons. Once I went over to MGM, I knew it was a mistake, but I had to fulfill my contract. <laughs> The minute it was up, I headed back to Warner Brothers. I was very happy to get back there. I didn't really want to get out of my contract, Leon. <laughs> uh, I was only fooling. <laughs> yeah, April Fool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Porky. <laughs> I know you come back. You Ought to Be in Pictures, a great cartoon, and one of the few forays of mixing live action and animation at Warner Brothers. <laughs> was a bit of an autobiographical film for Frizz, and legend has it that You Ought to Be in Pictures is his version of saying, thanks for having me back, Leon. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good evening, Mr. D. Am I the first to arrive? Uh, by the way, what's on the menu for tonight? In other words, what's cooking, Doc? Friss's earliest cartoons with Bugs Bunny, he was a very New York-y guy, and I think it's something that Frizz tried to keep.